The Mazda CX-50. We've already done a video during the launch event where we drove this off-road in a lot of cow dung. Now we're gonna do a video where 99.9% .9 of people live and that's on-road. So let's look at the outside and inside first. When you look at the exterior of this, this zircon sand, oh man, do I feel outdoorsy. I could almost go out in my backyard and dig up some holes and refill them and just feel like I've done something powerful. There is a good contrast with the CX-50, I will say this, where the black unpainted plastic does match the character of the vehicle quite a bit more than what we saw on the CX-30. There's a good road presence to this. It doesn't look like a cookie cutter commodity like shitbox SUV, that's for sure. The inside part of this car is definitely a deviation of what we've seen on the CX-30 and the Mazda 3, where they've de-luxuryified many of the features. There's far less soft touch plastic, soft touch materials. There's no cork in this model. And that's because of course, you know, if I'm hitting the, hitting the sand or loose gravel, uh, in a drive through I, I don't need that to get all f basically all screwed up. And that's the point of this. The outside matches the inside. Now let's talk about some of the usability features. The back doors open up wide so you can get your fat ass in the back seat. And the good part is it's pretty comfortable back there with the exception is you can't recline the seats. They do fold down 60-40 split, which is great. But the bottom bolster, bottom cushion feels very cheap. In fact, you can like lift up the whole thing with two fingers. Uh, I don't know if it's just this press car or all of them are like that, but it's something to note. This interior space definitely feels more cost cut than some of the other newer Mazda products. It's very monochromatic overall. The hatch space has more cargo capacity than the Mazda CX-5, so you might really welcome that. This just feels like a bigger space overall, as it should, given its dimensions. Back to the front, let's look at this. Your HVAC controls are all physical for your steering wheel heater, your cooler, your heater, all the knobs, buttons, and switches are right at your fingertips. You don't have to interact with the infotainment basically ever, which is great. Any knob or button or switch in here pretty much has iconography where you can be a complete doofus and still figure out what everything does. The gauge cluster has a multi-function facet to it, but it's very basic. It's just for like fuel economy and safety. So you're not screwing around with anything. The infotainment, once you get used to the fact there's no touchscreen and that you're using a giant D-pad, it's very, very great to work. It's super easy to use and getting through menus is basically pain-free once you know what you're doing. It has wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which pairs up very fast, at least for me on my phone. And then basically all the center console is that's the only place where you have the piano black stuff. All the knobs, buttons, and switches are a carry over here. It's very easy to get to, and on the upper trim levels, you get a wireless charger where your phone is quite easily slipped in here and easy to get to. Uh, overall, the interior space is very functional, and I'm gonna leave it at that. Let's get into the shop and talk about some of the technical stuff. Underneath the Mazda CX-50, Jack, this is our first chance at looking at it up close and personal. We, we did drive this off-road at the press event where we were covered in cow shit and flies, unless that was something you left behind. No, Mark, I didn't leave you a present, but instead I had them deliver us a premium Mazda vehicle built by Takumi's. This is the CX-50, as we said, and this is one of the higher trim levels. This car is built on a well, Mazda platform. It's a stretched version, which you find from the Mazda 3, which means it's strut front, torsion beam rear. This can be had as either front wheel drive, all wheel drive, or with a naturally aspirated four cylinder or a turbocharged four cylinder, and it has a six speed automatic. Torque converted automatic, so no CVT here. This is the epitome of Mazda, or what you would call a commodity product. Something that most brands are trying to do to generate revenue. And that's a hard thing to do to balance good cost cutting and the, the features that people want. Think of this as like Mazda's equivalent of the RAV4, but nicer in some ways. The main takeaway is Mazda's tuning. The on-demand all-wheel drive system, which is optional, has a very progressive natural feel. All the inputs are trying to be one-to-one. -one. So there's no over-accelerated or hyper-accelerated steering, no crazy like instant on and off brake pedal pressure, throttle, Throttle control is really easy and natural. All the inputs match up, including the suspension tuning. And this is something Mazda is very good at, and they've tried to carry this over to this mainstream 
SUV thing that's supposed to be that urban, more urban-y off-road adventure type vehicle. With a lot more space compared to the CX-5 or CX-30. We'll take this out on the street, Mark, to see if the torsion beam ruins this vehicle, because it is one of the more simplistic suspension setups in this segment. Simplistic, but effective. Man. We're not in California, Mark. Where are we? We're in Illinois, where <sighs> all the magic happens, Jack. Damn straight. You know what else is gonna happen? What? We're gonna do one of the hardest launches I've ever done in sport mode. Show me. Oh! I felt V8 without that much thrust, Mark. That's, that's impressive. That big engine noise, too, that really gets me going. Okay, I, I gotta ask an obvious question here. Why? I don't understand why manufacturers, and this isn't about Mazda, I, I just have to go on a short tirade. It makes 0% sense why you would have fake engine noise, especially in a car that you're trying to make quieter on top of it. Everything around this engine design is trying to be refined torque at the low end so you don't have to push down the throttle to get it going, and then you have this annoying synthesizer effect that you can't turn off. But it's off. so musical, Mark. All right, aside from that, the engine tuning here is tremendous because you can get a ton of torque and you can get a lot of power at the lower end with minimal effort on regular fuel. So if you're in an area where you're constrained by budget, you don't have to go and you pay $7 a gallon for premium to, to get this thing to feel peppy. It feels peppy all the time. And the six-speed automatic, while it may not be the most cutting edge gearbox on the planet, is very responsive, it's quick, it's seamless, and it doesn't stand out as being hyper annoying. It does exactly what you want, and it doesn't piss you off. So my question for you then is, in this segment, the, the standout to me, and yes, it's the most boring, like refrigerator-like SUV, yeah, NPC. Is, is the RAV4. Right. Because that thing will go for a million billion miles, right. it's big, and it, it's relatively inexpensive, but there's a big range of prices. You can be in the low 30s, high 20s, up into the mid yeah, to the low Yeah, the TRD 40s. and the yeah. Adventure version with the TV. Or the limited, the yeah. Yeah, where you can get crazy in price. But why would you buy this over that? I think one thing is there's not a lot of these on the road, and there probably won't be. Uh, it, has a, it does have a lot of physical character on the outside, like the Zircon color. It has this urban adventure, like... Uh, factor to it. it. It has a good body shape. Um, the interior is a lot larger. This was a big problem with the CX-5 that a lot of people had is you didn't have the cargo capacity. You're getting an SUV and you feel like you're, you're pigeonholed in there. This feels much bigger. It feels pretty airy as well. Like visibility is good and the ride quality is to me I think it's more refined while being better planted in corners and major maneuvers than the RAV4 is, a, a TVD version aside. I think on a technical level, yes, the suspension is far less sophisticated than the RAV4, right? That strut and multi-link, this being strut and torsion beam, I don't think it's necessarily as maneuverable at the highest extremes when you're really going for it, again, at least in the TVD variant of the RAV4, but you're right, under regular roads and when you're dealing with the head jounce or head bobble as Mazda calls it, this does a better job. It, it does. I think the ride refinement's better. They spent a lot of time in that. Mazda's always good on that and they haven't cheaped out here. Um, and the drivetrain's more refined in this car. It, it really is. I, I really think as a daily driver, I would much rather have this over the any four-cylinder Toyota. Honestly, in terms of drivability, it doesn't sound like a rattle box. Like the engine is not rattly as hell. Um, the drivetrain suspension tuning is all great. It really is. There's almost nothing to complain about here. Um, you could maybe complain the fuel economy could be better. You know, with the turbo version here, it you know I'm getting on average like 25 miles per gallon just in you know our regular driving. Um, and then there is a lot of tire noise off this car. I, I wouldn't say that it's. I would say it's pretty equivalent to everything else, but that would be one thing that I'd said they could definitely improve on is some road isolation. And if you want to spend less money, the basic four-cylinder, while it is very slow, does return better fuel economy, at least potentially in the real world, and it's similarly refined. <sighs> torque. It feels like, di I always say this, it feels like diesel levels of tuning and torque. It's just like instantaneous thrust. But I think, Jack, you know, 
other than what we've said, I think it's time to get in the final thoughts and we're going to sum all this up. All right, let's do it. Final thoughts on the Mazda CX-50. The takeaway is this is a pretty good SUV. They knew how to balance the features that people want, all the outdoorsy things that most people will never do, from higher ride height, more ground clearance, some off-road modes, uh, of course, and a more functional interior space with less premium materials. I think they did a good job at creating a commodity product that will sell in higher volumes, appeal to a larger brand of people, and even steal some customers away from like the CRV and the RAV4 because this has a bit more character. Now the negative parts really are a few things. One, as I drove it more, as much as I like the heavier steering feel, it started to wear on me, especially on some of these back roads where I'm constantly having to put input into the wheel. The other thing is there are more, or I would say, cheaper feeling materials on the inside, namely like I talked about in the interior space with the back seat. Some of the plastics are just very hard. Uh, I, I mean, I guess there's trade-offs. You have a panoramic roof here, which Mazda never did before. I mean, it's just the balance of what do you value? And I think the functional part of the CX-50 is really good. So take it for a drive, see what you think. See you next video.